you know, until I reached university, I was rather directionless. Never a rebel, but rather a dreamer. I, I didn't pay too much attention to classes. I'm sure I annoyed my teachers or to what I would want to do after I graduated from high school. So uh, I, I didn't have a direction until I reached the University of Manitoba. Uh, there, uh, I learned that I love physics. I'm sure there were signs before I reached the university that I loved physics. For example, I do remember as a youth, I would read anything that was before me, the cereal boxes. I read in one of my sis older sister's school books how a compound pendulum works. And I still remember thinking how wonderful that is. It was a hint that I like, and I like to build models because I like to build models, I entered the University in Engineering. Uh, I enjoyed it. I guess I could have made my life, way through life as a mediocre engineer. But to my eternal gratitude, a friend who I can name, David, Dale Loveridge, since I complained to him that we were running out of physics courses to take in engineering, why don't you transfer to physics? Perhaps you know the phrase, a duh moment? Well, that was a duh moment. Why didn't I think of that? So I entered physics uh, and loved it from the start. Uh, I owe a lot to the faculty, and I owe a lot to the students, too. You know, a student learns a lot from fellow students. We don't give that enough attention, I think. Nothing I like better than to see students arguing over how to work a problem. So, uh, also, my fellow students introduced me to Allison, saw us married, and off to Princeton University as a graduate student. Um, I've, the faculty member who told me I would go to graduate school in physics at Princeton, Ken Standing, died just a year or so ago. It was a great pleasure to meet him prior to that. He had his own distinguished career in uh, the structures of large bio biomedical, bio biological molecules, biochemical molecules, I'm not sure of the phrase. Anyway, uh, I love physics. It just grabs me and still does. Well, one, one way to put it, I think, is that event with the compound pulley. The compound pulley is at the one and the same time rather subtle, but yet explicit within the framework of the, of the game. And similarly, physics is layer upon layer of concepts such as a compound pulley. Each compound, complex, each, what am I trying to say? Each element of physics is, when looked at from afar, a compound pulley. It's a simple concept, well-defined, and subtle but yet direct, straightforward in many ways. And physics is just a hierarchy of such things. I find that neat. I suppose I'm also satisfied by the fact that in physics you get to settle arguments because you can do experiments and you can find out whether or not this concept makes sense. It's also <clears throat> relative to say, oh, biology, much simpler, and I do treasure that simplicity. Again, um, my impression of a biologist is someone who is wading through depths of complications. It's just so subtle. Whereas in basic physics, which is the kind I enjoy, you can actually start from the fundamentals and work your way up, layer upon layer of compound pulleys. Can't do that with biophysics because it's just too, too complicated. I guess I could have made my way through life as a biophysicist too, but I wouldn't have been as happy. Yes, I can mention two. I've already mentioned one, Ken Standing at the University of Manitoba. You know, I reflect back and I don't remember him ever saying, I suggest you go to the University of Manitoba, of Princeton for graduate study. It was rather, uh, you will of course go to Princeton. Uh, it, it set my life 
Uh, without, if I hadn't gone to Princeton, I wouldn't have met <clears throat> my second uh, and really top advisor, Professor Robert Henry Dickey, Bob to everyone, who was an inspiration when I arrived. He has doing gravity physics, which of course led to cosmology. He has just the sort of skills that I really take a delight in. He understands physics very well, but he understands also how to apply it. And to a very, very much a person who likes the combination of theory and practice, which totally grabbed me and still does. So Bob Dickey, uh, I have called for many years my professor of continuing education. He's, alas, no longer with us, but uh, through the years he taught me so much. Not only about physics, but also don't be messy with your physics. The one time he would get hostile is when you were sloppy in your thinking. And that soon cured me of being sloppy. Well, do you, know, do you know that in the US, perhaps around the world, there are sites on which you can place money, wagers, on events, such as who will get the Nobel Prize? And it is, turns out that these sites have a pretty good record. You understand that the more money placed on a candidate for the Nobel Prize, the lower the payoff. So my university, and I think many others, keep track of the odds on faculty members. And so for the last two years, I've had an enigmatic message from our Department of Public Relations. If you need help, we will, if you need help with publicity, we will come to your aid. No explanation, no mention of Nobel. But at this time of year, you wonder. So I was slightly prepared. And you know, to be honest, uh, I think it was a good choice. Yeah, I've been riding this wave my entire career. So that was great. Um, you know, they call at a definite hour here in Sweden, which may be a very different hour at the laureate's home. So um, five o'clock, the call. And you know, at that hour, either it's something really bad or something really good. So uh, I, I was somewhat prepared when I picked up the telephone. Allison's first words were, oh God. <laughs> uh, the university was prepared and they had laid on elaborate celebrations through the day. Totally exhausting, but still awfully rewarding. Well, you know, there is one piece of advice that I keep advising, keep offering. Um, don't judge your career by the number of prizes and awards. I have so many, and it's wonderful. And the Nobel Prize is absolutely spectacularly wonderful. But to get such a prize requires not only dedication and creativity, it requires eventualities. The, the, the cards must line up just so in order to make it appropriate for a prize-winning um, committee to, to, uh, to recommend you. Don't, don't count on those eventualities. Judge your career by how well you did at it. And of course, don't be sloppy. My advice, my, my central advice to a young person considering entering a science of any sort, any natural science, look around, discover what really interests you. It may not be the first thing that you notice. You may find something mildly interesting, but if you look a little harder, you'll find something even better. Don't jump into a particular line of research until you've looked around quite carefully and discover that which really fascinates you. If you're fascinated, you'll do well. You understand that teaching, uh, the students learn from a good teacher and the teacher learns from the students. Also, you know, there is the comment of Samuel, Samuel Johnson. Nothing quite concentrates the mind like the prospect of being hanged. 
and uh, not quite as serious, but the prospect of having a student ask a question that you haven't anticipated is something that makes me very uneasy. So, uh, of course, when I teach, I prepare. And I try to think of all of those odd little side issues that I've never perhaps thought through. They happen, and I learn from that. Also, of course, uh, it's so lovely to see young people who are interested in something, so interested that they'll sit here and take notes from what I say. And of course, as I emphasize time and again, they're learning from each other. Nothing I love more than to see a group of students arguing over how to work a problem. So that's rewarding. And because I love physics, you're not surprised to learn I enjoy talking about it. And so, uh, yes, um, I have taught both students who are advanced in physics, who are deeply interested in physics, and those who take the course as a requirement. The, the last is far by far the most difficult. How do you persuade these people that physics is not simply a hurdle to pass so they could get on and do something they really want to do, perhaps medicine? How do you convince them that this is a fascinating subject? In part, you know, I think we have to be fatalistic about that. Some people are charmed by a compound pulley and some are not. Perhaps you don't particularly care about compound pulleys, but they're neat. And uh, perhaps not neat for you, but for some of they are. So I guess I do have the seat of the pants feeling, feeling that different people are suited for very different activities. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? it must be. So if I, my test might be offer them a compound pulley. Do you think that's neat or would you rather I would stop talking about it? So most of the time I have taught people who think a compound pulley is neat, even though they've never considered that before. By far, as I say, the most difficult is teaching those who are not so sure compound pulleys are neat. The most depressing question is, is this going to be on the exam? The most important qualities of being a teacher, I think, surely is the enthusiasm for what you are trying to teach. And perhaps it's equally important, you should pay attention to the student. That seems pretty obvious, but I suppose if you are a teacher who don't, and you don't enjoy your job, then I think it would be good if you found another line of work. If you enjoy your job, it means you are just love trans transforming and transmitting information to the student. And you'll notice the student either understanding what you're saying or not. And if the latter, you're, you're going to try hard to, to get the student's attention. That was when we used to have hour and a half long lectures. To stop halfway in between uh, was a good way not only to get them awake, because it's rather hard to sit for an hour and a half, but also I found there are students who have questions and they don't want to ask them because they don't want to be the subject of attention. And the breaks were a wonderful way for a student who is diffident to approach me. Um, I don't know how to encourage such people to speak up. No one's going to bite them. Some people are just like that. And so the break was always a good way not only to refresh all of the students, but also to give the diffident ones the chance to talk to me. As I reach the golden years, I, I find that I enjoy physics. So I don't often take much time off. I love going into the laboratory and writing or calculating or reading. I used to enjoy gardening quite a lot. In recent years, well, physical effort is becoming more difficult. The fact that the market gardens have tomatoes in immense abundance when I have my pitiful few tomatoes, uh, I stopped gardening. However, well, I just, I spent the last two years full time on a book on how we got from where we were in the past to now in cosmology. The book is now done. It will be out next spring. Uh, I have still some deep jobs to do in, in uh, checking 
proofs, but that the labor is pretty much over. And I think I will not get myself involved in another project that's quite that intense, and that maybe I will start gardening again. I think maybe flowers rather than vegetables. Um, I'm deeply fortunate uh, that we live just one mile from my office. It's a mile through almost entirely quiet residential streets. So walking to and from the lab is to me refreshing and a chance to let my mind wander. I've always, when walking, paid very little attention to where I put my feet. And so uh, the mind can wander in totally random, irrelevant, silly directions, but sometimes it will land on a little point. Why didn't I think of this? Rather a da, da type moment. Though it's interesting, uh, I discovered a few years ago that I was tripping. And you know a face plant when you fall. It happened to me three times in one year. I, no injuries at any time, but it's such a shock to suddenly find yourself prone. So I have started looking where I put my feet to the detriment of my thinking. What should I do? I think I will continue to watch where I put my feet. I will pay a little more attention to that, but I will also continue to enjoy walking and letting my mind wander. I hate running. I can't imagine operating a treadmill uh, or pumping, pumping weights. That sounds so dull. But uh, to me, a walk in the woods or in the city is, is, is pleasant, always is. Oh, oh, of course, they're, they're, uh, in our field, it, it, we, are leaving, we are leaving to the future generations a lot of interesting research problems. The subject, do you know, it's rather difficult to convince non-scientists of the fact that we at the same time have a reliable science, well-established, and yet there are simple questions they can ask of you that you can't answer. It's particularly notable in cosmology when you consider that we postulate this dark matter. We postulate this cosmological constant or dark energy they surely have deep physical meaning that we do not understand. What a glorious opportunity. Explain this. It is, it is, as I say, a subtle business to explain that we have both great open problems and yet a securely established physics. The point is, of course, all of our physics is approximations. We have no complete theory in any branch of physics or any other natural science. We instead have approximations that are good or more or less well established depending on the evidence. We have so much evidence for cosmology that I think it's almost a dead cert that the dark matter is there. We know that its properties must be in a, in a defined range, but that range is pretty broad. We're sure that it must be there, and the great triumph will be to identify it. Lots of experiments going on, attempting to do that. Watch your local newspaper for announcements. Mm -hmm.